welcome to the season two of Sustainability 100 Plus. Today, we kickstart the first state summit with a focus on Haryana, a state that has recently seen a rise in the national SDG ranking through smart agricultural initiatives and prudent water management. It is my honor and privilege to introduce you with an inspiring lineup of eminent leaders and key stakeholders. We have a keynote from uh, Honorable Deputy Chief Minister of Haryana, Shridushan Chutala, followed by a fireside chat with industry stalwart Shri R.C. Bhargava, who is the chairman of Maruti Suzuki, and followed by a panel discussion with industry leaders and a masterclass, which is run by our in-house agro-expert. Haryana holds a very strong focus for ABNWF India, and we have a long-standing relationship with the state. We have our brewery, Haryana Breweries Limited, located in Sonipat, which is one of our oldest breweries and caters to almost the whole of North India. Budweiser, which is one of our fastest growing premium brands in the country, is brewed in Haryana Breweries Limited. We work very closely with farmers across the state to procure barley that we use to brew our beers. And we have been working with them for a very long time, especially around good agricultural practices and techniques and digitization. We are also water neutral in Haryana and we have also constructed over 50 structures till, uh, water structures till date. Uh, we have also introduced a women economic empowerment program for, uh, for rural communities, which is focused on upskilling, financial and digital inclusion and promotion of micro entrepreneurship. We aim to empower over 500 women within a year in the district of Sonipat. We have also uh, recently held two mega health camps for nearby communities in Sonipat in association with HSRLM and with the chief medical officer of Sonipat. With these camps, we have uh, reached out to more than 10 villages with a population of 36,000 uh, covered and uh, more than 1,400 uh, community uh, members have benefited from these medical camps. So we look forward to a very interesting summit. continue to highlight success stories and also appreciate the mechanisms used by governments, civil society and industrial establishments and NGOs in some of the key states of the countries, the states that have focused their efforts on achieving inclusive growth, keeping the SDGs as the main framework. Today, we shine the spotlight on the state of Haryana. Haryana has been amongst the foremost states in the country to envision the future of the state based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In fact, during the Economic Survey 21-22, tabled in the Parliament, the state was also included in the leading states in the Niti Aayog SDG India Index 2020-2021. So today, in the Sustainability 100 Plus presented by ABN Bev, we will throw light on what Haryana has done right for exponentially improving its standing in the National SDG Index, how the state has challenged and diversified conventional crop patterns for water conservation and smarter agriculture, and also what will it take to help Haryana stay on the path through collective efforts and accountability from all its stakeholders. And to understand that and more, I'm joined by Mr. Dushyant Singh Chautala, Deputy Chief Minister of Haryana. Welcome to the show, Mr. Dushyant. It's great to have you here with us. Thank you. So we're discussing uh, Haryana's SDG tracker, measuring progress and laying the roadmap based on early lessons. So my first question to you is, Haryana has been ranked as the fastest growing state in the Niti Aayog Sustainable Development Goal Index 2020-2021. So if you could take us through the concentrated efforts that have been taken in the last couple of years and also some of your early lessons while balancing growth and sustainability. We have been doing pretty well and the proactive measures the state has taken, especially when it came to Swachh Bharat and going ODF free, 
Haryana was one of the first states to get ODF++. When it came to infrastructure development, we were the fastest growing state when it came to overall infrastructure, either in terms of roads, in terms of providing water to every household, uh, having schools at every level, having medical colleges. And I think during COVID also, we took that risk to put thrust on our infrastructure as well as our health services. And I think we succeeded in that. Well, a lot of focus has been given to providing clean drinking water for each and every household in Haryana. And the state has set rather ambitious goals for itself. So how has the journey been so far? See, we have taken two measures. First, first measure is we have to clean our own ponds that keeps the groundwater clean. And we have to clean the ponds in our state. We have about 14,000 ponds around the state and Haryana has put extensive measures. We are going to spend about 1,000 crores on excavation and cleaning of those ponds. Whereas it comes to drinking water, we already have water connectivity to each and every village of the state, which is provided by our public health department. In the urban areas also, we have made sure that we have the capacity for cleaning of water as well as that water is provided to every household with the guidelines which the centre gives that in urban areas we give 140 litres per person and in rural areas is 70 litres per person. And I think that is one step in the northern region of the country, Haryana was first and foremost to take. And I think uh, that has been a success story for the country also, where uh, the Prime Minister has also appreciated Haryana for providing, under uh, Jal Shakti, providing clean water to every household. Haryana has also done extremely well uh, with regards to crop diversification. And the Mera Pani, Meri Virasat scheme has been extremely well received. So if you could take us through the kind of efforts that you had to take on ground in convincing farmers to take more sustainable practices. See, it was a, it was a uh, tough step, but yes, we have uh, been successful. Last year, when we said Meri Pani, Mira Virasat, and diverted people from moving from uh, paddy to other crops, we saw one lakh acre, one lakh hectares of land which was converted, and we had to give uh, incentives to farmers, and we paid five thousand rupees per farmer per acre for uh, conversion. But yes, we are successful. People have moved to oil seeds. People have moved to uh, other uh, crops. And the result is that Haryana is one state which gives MSP on all 13 uh, crops. As well as we have made sure like the Bajra crop which came last season. When there was no requirement for the government and there was a price gap between the market and the MSP. Haryana supported its farmers with 600 rupees. In Haryana, you have also championed the idea of introducing climate change as a part of the school curriculum. So could you tell us a little bit about the steps that you had to take to make sustainability a part of the school culture? I had requested the Prime Minister by writing a letter to him to introduce it at college level. But after the new education policy uh, which has come up, I think it is going to be an agenda for every university and college to come up. But uh, the idea you have given us is also very good that we should look into introducing it in schools also and we will we'll definitely work on that. And I am hopeful that by next year we have a full bridge course on climate change which goes up from class 1 to class 12 where students learn also about the climate and uh, I think uh, successfully move forward with helping us into uh, cleaning our environment. So one last question for you, Mr. Dushan. Are there any innovative partnerships, tie-ups with international agencies or state institutions that have really helped you in keeping Haryana on track to achieving its vision for 2030? We have multiple projects which are ongoing. There is a project with the uh, Government of Israel which is on improving our agriculture sector. We have multiple projects going on with the UK government. The British High Commission here at Chandigarh is also supporting us where our excise department has been working with them to learn more about GST. There is a project of agriculture department which is ongoing with the British Council 
we have works on education also which are going on going we have projects which are funded by the nabard or the world bank so there have been multiple projects which are on going and if there is a requirement in future we we will not step back we have created a foreign corporation department with this vision that there is more coordination and more uh, development with ideas coming in from all across the world well thank you for sharing all those insights mr dushant and wishing you all the very best as haryana keeps moving forward on the path of development thank you so much for joining us plus platform today we are focusing on the state of haryana and how communities government and corporates they are coming together to further improve upon the state's sdg that is sustainability development goal index we will be evaluating the success story of maruti in haryana as they complete four decades of partnership now we are joined by someone who's been instrumental in scaling up maruti's operation in india and specifically haryana Without much ado, I would like to welcome Mr. R C Bhargava, who is the chairman of Maruti Suzuki. Mr. Bhargava, it is a pleasure having you with us on this show. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Nice being here. So, my first question, of course, is the fact that uh, Haryana is completing four decades of partnership with Japan, and Maruti slated to establish its third manufacturing facility in Haryana as well. How has the experience been so far? How have you seen the state's approach change towards balancing industrial growth and also sustainable and inclusive development? You know, we have obviously had a very good run in Haryana. We started. production in december 83 and uh, reached full production at the golgaon plant then we bought and with the support of haryana government we got more land in manesar then we built by in steps 3 production line in haryana so that in uh, manesar so manesar can now produce about 800000 cars a year having completely exhausted the Uh, limits of capacity building in the state we now look for the third site and again we sought the cooperation and help of the state government and with their support we have been able to buy uh, about 900 acres of land in karkoda where we will establish further manufacturing capacities which could go up to a million if the market sustains that kind of demand okay and uh, you know that is good to know that uh, you are putting out that third manufacturing facility in haryana the government has been supportive about that as well but you know haryana like a lot of other states continues to take strides towards attracting ma uh, automobile manufacturing units in the state in what is conventionally uh, an agrarian state what role do organizations like maruti uh, they will play in ensuring that the agriculture ecosystem benefits from these developments as well you know the increase in the incomes of people living of agriculture cannot really happen unless employment opportunities for people in the villages arise outside the villages mm -hmm. the pressure on the land has to decrease and because agriculture grows at something between 2 and 4% a year depending on the season and with that kind of growth and taking into account population growth uh, substantial increases in per capita income can only happen if the population dependent on agricultural income reduces one of the great benefits of uh, setting up big companies which create a lot of uh, employment downstream is that it provides a huge number of opportunities for people from villages to find employment outside 
the agricultural sector. So what has happened as a result of Maruti and uh, the other auto companies that have come into Haryana is that the pressure on land has decreased. The people there have found other very paying opportunities to work and agricultural incomes have started going up. That is, I think, the major effect of uh, industrialization on agriculture. Oh, yes, and a positive one at that. Uh, Mr. Bhargam, on a macro level, India at COP26 put out uh, their targets of net zero by 2070. Do you think it is very aspirational or it is a new opportunity for India Inc? It's an aspirational target, but as the government has made clear in international negotiations, achieving this target requires a huge investment and also access to newer technologies. You take the whole area of power generation. 75% of the energy which we have in India today is coal-fired. Now to replace that coal-fired energy with cleaner energy is not an easy task, especially when the annual demand for energy will go up as the development process takes place. And that requires huge investments it requires new technologies. We've seen the, pro, pro, the problems which have come up in nuclear power development because of various issues which happen. So where do we get the source of energy to replace coal? And if we don't replace coal as a source of energy, we have a problem. So it is aspirational. It still gives opportunities for everybody in this country to find better ways of doing manufacturing activities, transportation activities, and it also casts a burden on the international community to look at the bigger picture of climate change and environment and support countries like India with technology and funds so that this transition can happen as quickly as possible. Hmm. You know, while we are talking about climate change, a lot of things have changed globally in the recent past. We are talking about the recent geopolitical developments that has, of course, changed the supply chain. Uh, do you think it will give boost to make in India or it'll be, it is something uh, that will take some time? We are, we'll still be dependent on global suppliers. I think the uh, supply chain uh, system is changing. A lot of people are moving out of China. India is getting some part of that, not the, all of it, because it's going to other countries also, but we are benefiting from that. It is important that uh, India develops as much of its own supply chain for its production as possible. That's where Atma Nirbhar Bharat comes along, because we have seen in the last two, three years, the high risks which are attendant upon depending on critical supplies of components and materials from outside. And I think uh, the lesson is very clear that uh, when the Prime Minister talks of Atman Nirbhar Bharat, it is something which is in the interest of every industry, every person who is connected with manufacturing to see how best to increase local production of what they need. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think uh, the changes are happening and uh, it's a combined action between the government and industry. Oh, yes, absolutely it is. Uh, so, Mr. Bhargav, any specific policy push from the government that you think is exciting? Is hydrogen a sector or a segment which you think will be the next growth trigger for the, company, uh, for the country? Or you think EV adoption it will take precedence? That is something we should start looking at first before we look at hydrogen. Well, at the moment, EV is being given greater uh, priority over hydrogen. Hydrogen development requires a lot more of, uh, I think, R&D work and development work and infrastructure building before it can become a viable source of energy. On the other hand, the advantages of uh, hydrogen is that unlike the EV sector, we will not be dependent on raw materials which are all imported. And we will not be dependent, ultimately raw materials are all finite. Whereas if you go for hydrogen, the raw material is virtually infinite. And therefore, if I look at it purely in theoretical terms, I would say the long-term answer for the global situation is hydrogen. 
But how long and how much time and effort and resources would be required to develop hydrogen is something which I'm not really fully aware of. And maybe for practical reasons, EVs will come earlier. Hmm. But of course, a lot of developments happening in both the places. Uh, Mr. Bhargav, thank you so much, sir, for joining us today and giving us your time and discussing something which is indispensable and has become a part of overall economy as well as uh, more sectors as well. Thanks a lot for joining us, sir, today. Thank you. interesting panel discussion that looks at three key pillars that we are looking at agriculture industries and empowerment now if we look at the scheme of things uh, there is a there are a range of uh, issues that are involved in all the three pillars and to discuss this we have with us eminent panelists dr vibha dhavan the, the DG for Terry. We have Mr. Siraj Chaudhary, uh, who heads the National Commodities and Management Services. Then we have Mr. Ramnath Padyanathan, who heads Environmental Sustainability at Godrej. And finally, we have Mr. Madhwan, who is the Chief Executive for Water 8. So, welcome to this interesting panel discussion. Let me sort of start by giving a brief introduction to the theme. Uh, and like I said, there are three key pillars that we are looking at today. Agriculture, industry, and empowerment. And to give a bit of a background, the three pillars essentially come from three, uh, three things that have happened in the real past. One is the Paris Agreement, which gave a big fillip to the uh, to the sustainability bandwagon. And then you have uh, the SDGs, which cover a whole range of issues where uh, things need to be done nationally across the world. And then in India, there was the Companies, Companies Amendment Act, which brought forth the mandatory CSR. And all three, in some sense, linked to the three key themes that we have today. Now, agriculture becomes an extremely important area because food is an absolute necessity for life, right? Uh, that's one key thing that is there. Uh, and one needs to look at it from both quantity and quality perspective. Good quality food, nutritional food becomes important for everyone. And all that really comes from uh, making sure that agriculture is done in a, in, in a sustainable manner, the inputs are sustainable, and that ensures that the, the quality of the grains becomes important. The second pillar is industry, where we are really getting focused on, on net zero. And industry is really facing this issue. And especially having come out of a situation where there has been cash flow compression. Uh, so even large firms are finding it difficult. More so, the difficulty lies with small and medium enterprises. Finally, we have uh, the empowerment. And empowerment really has to do with, with communities, with people. Uh, there's the urban poor and uh, there is the rural poor. And they all face significant problems. We've always talked about the issues around roti, kapla, makan, uh, food, shelter, clothing. But there are also issues around clean air, water, sanitation, skills, employment. And there is this wide range of themes that we are going to be sort of uh, grappling with in, in today's discussion. Vibha, talk through a, to us a little bit about, uh, about agriculture and how 
agriculture has become so important and uh, we need to increase productivity of agriculture crop resilience and so so, so coming from Terry, you would have done a lot of work in these areas and we would like to have your views food security is a very important issue for all the nations and india had covered a long journey uh, ever since we got independence we were at a stage that food for even the existing population in early 70s, we were unable to feed them. But today we are in a position that we have enough food, not just for our own population, but also we are exporting food. But all said and done, affordability of food remains an issue. There are a large number of people, even today, who are unable to afford food and more so the nutritious food. So in terms of malnutrition, uh, in India is not doing great. We have to go uh, cover long miles before we can say that we are able to give safe and nutritious food to our population. We are still, in terms of population, we are still growing. And also, let's look at our natural resources, which are finite. Water especially because the water table in most states is going down and almost 80% of the fresh water is used for agriculture. So therefore, it is extremely important to save this fresh water as much as possible and to some extent look at match species, plants, what crop should be grown in what area so that they don't become water deficient in years to come. Land also is a finite resource, and we also have the challenge of changing climate. It's well documented with well-researched papers that countries, including India, are going to be worst affected due to the changing climate. So this calls for a research in a different direction, and that is that develop varieties which can tolerate heat stress, which can tolerate water stress, or extremes of temperature, what we are facing to, uh, today, extreme extremes of events, whether it is rains or heat or so on. So the other is work on the agronomy. It's more crop per drop. So you judiciously use water resource. The third is like the, what we are facing today due to the Ukraine-USSR war, is that food security is going to become an issue not just this year, because they produce a lot of wheat, it's going to be problematic next year as well. And that's largely because the production of fertilizer has been impacted. Otherwise, also, as a country, we are giving huge subsidy on urea. Can we think of that we produce fertilizers with less of GHG emissions, and at the same time, they are easy to transport. So the overall effectivity of fertilizer increases. And on the other hand, you are not polluting the environment. And nano fertilizer is one such technology. Uh, recently, uh, IFCO had come out with nano urea. In Terry also, we had developed lots of nano fertilizers, different chemicals and uh, pesticides and so on. So. Food security, I'll say it is, it's a challenge, but something with good research and implementation, we will be able to overcome, we will be able to provide enough food to all the citizens on this planet. Now, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, ask Siraj, since he also looks at commodity management and food security in some sense uh, is linked to that and would like to have it his thoughts as well. As responding to the same question, I think uh, the concern on food security is very valid. Uh, however, what I would like to add is it's the choices that we make within the ambit of food security. I mean, today's I, India's problem, and I'm saying uh, we do produce enough. So uh, at least the basic cereals, I think uh, India is in a unique position relative to a lot of other countries in the world who are either surplus or deficit. I mean, India has a much... Uh, lower trade flow relative to uh, some of the similar size economies because we are 
essentially consuming most of what we are producing. This year was a unique opportunity where the world needed, uh, thanks to Russia-Ukraine war, the world needed cereals, which um, India was in a position to supply. And a country like India, uh, and for the size of our population, we did a great job by being able to supply free grain to a large population during the pandemic, and which was a sustainer. Now, what is uh, to be focused on, and I think this is where uh, it is about securing our future, is really how are we producing what we are producing? We have obviously come a long way from uh, being a ship to mouth country in the 60s, 70s to being a self-sufficient country. But there is a cost that has been paid for it. I mean, there has been obviously incentives to the farmers by providing them in large growing states with free power, free electricity, subsi subsidized uh, fertilizers. And that has actually got us into a bad habit of producing more with more resources. And I think that equation needs to be reversed because those resources, as we realize, are increasingly are getting uh, fewer and that needs to be addressed because otherwise we are somewhere mortgaging our future to our current uh, greed to produce more. So uh, so when we talk about agriculture uh, and food supplies, India, I mean, just to give you an example, which is very basic and clear, and uh, somehow hasn't yet caught uh, as much attention. I mean, India is a big exporter. I mean, our biggest agri exports is rice. And one of the other bigger one is sugarcane. Water consumption, I mean, it takes three to 5,000 liters per wat of water to produce a kilo of rice. And India is exporting about 20 million tons of rice so just uh, some 40 plus billion cubic meters of water getting exported similarly sugarcane or uh, you know livestock uh, products that are being uh, exported so i think our choice of what we produce and what we create i mean generate and this is being produced obviously we are exporting because there is a surplus being generated and that surplus is being generated because there is a subsidized cost of producing it uh, which is then making us more competitive in the rest of the world and when it is not we are actually giving subsidies to export some of these commodities. So I think that uh, mindset has to change. While we talk about climate change, we talk about Paris 2015, uh, I think a lot of conversations happened around uh, the industrial side of it. Uh, what is important is, and particularly for a country like India, where there is a over 50% population uh, plowing the field and agriculture is important for food and food security, uh, I think our agriculture needs, uh, or our approach to agriculture needs a revisiting purely from a sustainability and uh, environment management, because the biggest loser of this environment turning hostile or deteriorating is going to be Indian agriculture. I mean, just a, uh, you know, a marginal increase in temperatures, which we are talking about, does impact the productivity of rice. Um, similarly, in winters, it impacts the productivity of wheat. Uh, and not just the productivity that is getting affected, it is actually the nutritional content. I mean, higher heat is or sorry higher carbon uh, presence in the environment is depleting uh, the nutrition um, ingredients or uh, in the crop uh, particularly zinc and iron and so somewhere we are depleting our uh, food potential our food nutrition uh, in meeting today's need uh, somewhere we are affecting our future going forward so therefore if we are not addressing it today we are only making life difficult for our Future and our need for food is going to continue to increase as we prosper, as we convert, as our economy grows. So I think those are the areas that need more attention than just uh, conversations. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you you raised some extremely interesting uh, uh, thoughts uh, and uh, and one of the issues that you raised was about water. And I would uh, now like like Mr. Madhwan to really talk us through some of the issues around water that you see in this uh, uh, field and you obviously would be trying to help out uh, uh, agriculture as with, with these things. So, so how would you look at this situation? Almost three-fourths of the drinking water requirements in rural India are met by groundwater. Now we are seeing that uh, of this groundwater, agriculture tends to be for agriculture, water use for irrigation, is the largest consumer of this groundwater. So in some sense, if water use by agriculture does not change and it continues to be as inefficient as it is, we run the risk of not being able to provide for drinking water for our families uh, for times to come. We're witnessing groundwater levels falling in many parts of the country. Climate change, we really don't know what the impact of this is going to be. It poses enormous new risks. 
and in some sense could not just jeopardize agriculture, but also jeopardize drinking water availability in the future. Now, the, it's important to recognize that in all of this, there is a differential impact in terms of both women, uh, adolescent girls who currently face a significant amount of, board, of the burden to fetch water for their families. There's also a differential impact in terms of equity. Low income families are likely to be much more vulnerable to any of this change as compared to other families. Now, if you look at Jal Jeevan Mission, which is one of the flagship programs of the government, which seeks to make water availability in every household in India by 2024, what Jal Jeevan Mission does or seeks to do is essentially to make what is normal for you and me the norm for everyone else in this country, which is that in your house, you have a tap where you will have access to water. It seeks to end the days where you'll have to walk to fetch water for your families and therefore increases the possibility of greater availability of water at a household level. But if you look at Jal Jeevan Mission, the easy part of it is to actually lay the pipelines. The biggest threat to Jal Jeevan Mission is actually the fact that if the source of water is not sustainable, there is a risk that this investment is going to be made in pipe water supply systems without adequate water and to be able to supply those systems. So we're likely to generate a demand, but might not be able to sustain it if our groundwater levels don't improve over a period of time. So I think our big challenge for us is how do we try and balance these competing interests? The fact that water is critical and is being used, and particularly groundwater is used excessively for irrigation, and the fact that this has an impact on drinking water availability now and potentially in the future. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Madhavan. Uh, I'll now turn to the, to the second uh, uh, theme that is about industry. And I will bring in Ram here uh, from Godrej. Uh, and uh, you, you all have been celebrating 10 years of sustainability at uh, Godrej. I would like to learn from you uh, about how can companies meet the challenges of the net zero. I mean, it's a significant challenge that uh, all the companies are facing. Uh, and you, you, you're probably the, the best person to answer this. Absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of it stems from taking the first step, I would say. I think uh, we uh, realize that, you know, sometimes we often wait for the perfect solution rather than getting a move on. So, you know, one of the things I like to tell my team as well, and this is an ethos that we face sustainability across Godrej is, uh, do not let perfect be the enemy of good. So, you know, when we started off, there's always this, uh, you know, this fear that we won't be able to meet the targets or we won't be able to meet the goals. And net zero as a concept often seems very daunting to many companies. Yeah. So they start worrying about how they want to get there to that actual zero mark. But I would argue that even getting to 80% of the net zero uh, ambition for any company is a very, very big impact overall on the uh, ecosystem. So, you know, in, 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 in worrying about getting to the final goal, we must not lose track of the kind of impact that we can have by just by making some sort of improvements in terms of our emissions. And I think that's, that's one thing that's uh, really stood out. The other thing is obviously, you know, the, uh, the, uh, application of concepts such as carbon pricing and water pricing, uh, which have been really the big pivots on which we've been able to uh, invest in green technology. Uh, those really make the difference, you know, in terms of uh, uh, making uh, the green technologies more attractive to you know, business. Uh, the third thing that I would like to tell companies is that the, they should be very uh, cognizant of the fact that the old school way of thinking that sustainability is a cost and it's somehow at odds with profitability. Uh, it's absolutely, you can throw it out of the window because over the last 10, 15 years, there are enough financial indices, be it the Dow Jones or be it the Morgan Stanley Index, which clearly show that there is a direct link between companies that invest heavily on the ESG front and particularly in uh, emission abatement and their overall profitability. So even investors are looking uh, you know, to you know, companies that are stronger in terms of their environmental performance. So I think in terms of de-risking yourself, in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, providing a sort of a guidance for your investors. I think net zero taking up that ambition is a very, very good uh, idea. But I must also say that I think the world's conversation on carbon has shifted from net zero more towards the science-based targets. 
which focuses more on absolute emission reduction. And I think that's very important as well because uh, quite often the temptation to uh, balance the reduction through offsets tends to dominate the conversation rather than the focus on absolute emission reduction itself. So I think it's good for companies to have a net zero target, but I think it's equally important for them to focus on greening their energy sources and reducing their absolute emissions. Um, fourth, I would say, and this is, uh, I think, very relevant looking at the panel that we have over here, is that you must listen to experts. You must consult. Uh, sustainability is not a competition. I mean, it's, you know, we must get out of the competitive sphere when we uh, to speak as for businesses to our peers and uh, competitors, so-called competitors in the industry. And there are a lot of practices which we can share. So, you know, in this space, there is no competitive advantage or no nothing to be lost by sharing best practices and sustainability. So I think consult experts, speak to uh, industry bodies, uh, participate in a lot of these forums. That's very important. And uh, I, the last thing I would like to say in terms of, you know, what uh, lessons we can give is that it's okay to fall a little short of ambitious targets. What is not okay is not to set targets at all. I think it's very important to take that step. And you must embrace sustainability as a part of every function of the organization. It's easier said than done. When you start off in the early days of sustainability, any organization, you will always find it as almost an add-on function. It exists in its own sphere. But I think as time goes on, you realize that it has an impact on almost every aspect of the business, from whether it's de-risking and you know, uh, for your audits or your risk committees or for your finance uh, teams who are trying to understand where to make investments and how to plan it better. It permeates every aspect of it. So I think it's very important to bring that as a cultural shift rather than just have sustainability for the sake of it as part of your operations. Okay. So thank you so much. And uh, and Viva from Terry, uh, in some sense, uh, is closely linked to IPCC uh, in some sense. So, so I would like her to share her thoughts on how companies can go about uh, um, meeting their net zero targets. Yeah, Terry is very closely associated with this entire sustainable development goals, sustainability, net zero, and what companies can do. And we work both on the side of technology development as well as dissemination. Now, when you ask this question and what we are discussing about, first of all, it's a myth that cleaner is expensive. To me, it's a change in mindset that is required. And let's also look at the way the technology costs are coming down. For example, like when we talk of solar, about a decade back, CapEx was so high. And today, solar energy is something which is affordable. And really speaking, it, it's a sort of that it can solve many of the problems. But then solar cannot be used for all kinds of applications. And that is where people, we, our researchers are looking at other options like hydrogen in some places where there is potential of wind, over there wind, hydro, and so on. So there is bucket of technologies which are available. Some of them are expensive today, but as the technology will develop, and more so, the volumes will increase, the cost is bound to come down. So it's more of a mindset that we will have to change and say that we have to move towards sustainability. And all the, the COP meetings and the world community, they have also realized that we have only one planet to live. And the, and the actions done at one place indirectly or, the, or rather directly are going to have impact on the other region. So the West or the countries who owns the technology, they are also looking at possibilities of transferring these technologies to the developing countries. One of the big problems over there is that of CapEx. And all this carbon financing that is being discussed today, and it is not becoming a reality. And there I would like to say that please make investments because it is not one country or the other country, countries like India and many others, they have to develop and uh, more so it is important that their development is green. And over there, it is both the uh, government of India, the policy decisions which are being taken, they are all towards cleaner and greener future kind of investments. And also the promises which were, or rather the 
declaration made by the Honorable Prime Minister at Glasgow, that shows, first of all, what is the will of the government. So if we say by 2030, 50 percent is to be generated by renewable and by 2070 we have to be net zero and i like to remind you that the peak is still to come so it is not that we have reached the ultimate in terms of energy utilization now i'd like to turn to the third uh, the third pillar which is empowerment and th that is something which uh, a lot of operations are actively working at uh, essentially empowering the communities where they operate and i would like to learn from uh, uh, from ram as to what godrej does and how do you think this whole business of uh, empowering people can be sort of improved and brought ahead no absolutely i think uh, it's almost the logical next step or the, the logical parallel step i would say to any sort of sustainable behavior because the communities in which we operate and who also form part of our supply chain and the value chain are pretty much, uh, they, are, they are the ones who give us the, the social license to operate, so to say. I mean, uh, everything that we do in terms of the kind of products we create, the value we create uh, is built around and the kind of impact we have is built around uh, these people and the communities. So it's very important for us and to have a regular engagement in terms of the community and really listening to what is required there from both a social as well as from an environmental perspective. Uh, what is really, really critical is to focus on all the three pillars in terms of, say, employability, the livable conditions, uh, in terms of education, try to connect all the dots through all of our community outreach programs. So there are a couple of ways in which we do this. Uh, we, are, of course, you know, apart from uh, the CSR part of it, which, of course, focuses on either large programmatic uh, approaches we have, as well as some of the smaller community engagements. We also have a lot of uh, time put time and resources put in by the uh, employees themselves at each of our uh, sites in engaging with the community and understanding local needs and responding to them. So I think that's absolutely critical because not only do they form an essential part of the value chain, and even you know in many cases, they are also... Uh, you know, the people who are working in uh, many of our facilities from around the communities over there, these are also their children, their uh, descendants become your future uh, stakeholders and your future customers. And I think that's also a very important lens for us to uh, adopt because traditionally over the last uh, 10 or uh, I would say 15 years, we've been focused on sustainability in our operations. And I think it's very important we start looking at the entire value chain and looking beyond the scope of what we can do even though that's the more challenging one, because it's very difficult to influence what is not directly in your control. But this is something that uh, we are actively seeking to do. We've, uh, In fact, it's part, it forms part of our next uh, five-year strategy is to actually influence uh, our, uh, the sustainable consumption of the consumption and also build better ecosystems for our communities, be it through waste management projects, be it through uh, you know the energy access, or be it through education, or be it through other social impact initiatives. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd now like to ask Mr. Madhuan, because water and communities go together. And in some sense, water is something that empowers communities. So I would like to have his thoughts uh, on how water aid or his uh, thinking about water uh, helps the communities. So Utkarsh, it's without drinking water, without water for agriculture, life will not exist. Now, if you were to look at a lot of the work that's happening currently, it's largely around addressing issues around quality uh, to ensure that we're not just dealing with bacterial contamination, but we also have chemical contamination. One of the challenges that we're faced with is that increasingly we're seeing very high proportion of nitrates in drinking water, primarily because of leaching from agriculture. And this is becoming a problem that is fairly widespread. It's not just limited. So earlier you would have arsenic chloride contamination, particularly in the Indo-Gangetic Plain. We're also now seeing very high nitrate loads uh, in, in not just that area, but other areas where there's significant irrigation-based uh, agriculture taking place. So water quality continues to remain a big challenge, which is how do you ensure that the quality of water that families are, able, are consuming is actually safe? 
Now, one of the unfortunate tragedies around water quality is that the proxy for the average person is that if your water is clear, if your there is no odor and there's no smell and it tastes all right, you assume that the water is safe for consumption. That's not necessarily the truth. And so in the absence of widespread availability of testing facility, trying to change behaviors of people with regard to water quality tends to be a huge challenge. We need to take, need to take one larger leap, which is the tragedy in India is that areas which tend to be the most vulnerable from a water availability perspective also tend to be areas where you have very little investment uh, or industrial presence. And there's a mismatch between where the need is the greatest and where companies are willing to invest. And that's something that we would like to see companies take the leap or take the step to actually invest in areas which might not be a, you know, part of their supply chain or in their backyard, but where the need is the greatest. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Madhuan. Uh, I think it's been a very interesting discussion on all the three, uh, uh, three pillars that, that, that we were looking at. So thank you everyone uh, for, for coming in, spending your time. It's been an absolutely pleasurable discussion. for you today and look forward for your insights on them. So starting off with the first question, what are the most important considerations if someone wants to start their own farm? That's a really good question, Sukhanda. So when someone thinks about starting their own farm, I think the number one consideration is the location. Uh, where is the farm going to be located? Is it going to be the state of Rajasthan, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra? Because basis the location, uh, it will lead to a lot more decisions being finalized in terms of the type of crop that you're going to sow uh, and the weather that you're going to get. So the location becomes a very, very important factor uh, when thinking about starting your own farm. Then once the location is finalized, the second thing uh, that a farmer needs to ascertain is what is the type of crop that they'll be growing? Is it going to be a cash crop? Is it going to be a food crop? Is it going to be something related to horticulture? Uh, and you know, once the location is finalized, it's very important to understand the climate, what farmers have been doing in that region historically, uh, what are the trends in terms of farming in the region, uh, and basis this analysis, you arrive at the type of crop. The third thing to do once the type of crop is finalized is secure access to good seed, uh, farm inputs, and a crop protocol. Uh, seeds are very important because if your seed lot is bad, your harvest is going to be bad. You need access to the right kind of seed treated with the right uh, products to ensure it's resistant to insect attacks. Uh, then you need the right crop protocol. Uh, you need to have that guidance in place which tells you what to do, when to do. Uh, what does the farming season overall looks like? When does irrigation happen? When does nutrition application happen? So that needs to be defined really well. And then uh, you have, you need to secure the farm inputs to finally realize that crop protocol. So you need to make sure there's a supply chain connecting you to the fertilizers and uh, any other products that you want to use on the farm. 
after you've done all of this, the fourth bit then becomes uh, monitoring the actual crop. Once you put the seed in the ground, how is it growing? How is it in maturing? Uh, uh, is, uh, is it getting attacked by insects or pests or are there any diseases? Crop monitoring becomes very important. Uh, and it is a labor intensive process. You need to make sure you catch anything wrong on your farm pretty early on in the cycle, because otherwise you are looking at uh, uh, larger uh, yield losses purely because someone did not catch the problem in time. And then I think after all of this, once you take all of this into consideration, the most important criteria becomes time. If someone wants to do farming, they need to have time. They need to, uh, they also need the right resources, the right education, the right staff on the farm. But, you know, farming is a time intensive business. You need to be on the farm. You need to make sure things are happening properly. Uh, and you, you need to make sure you have the bandwidth uh, to monitor and improve the farm over time. Uh, you can't, it can't run in a silo without supervision. Thank you so much, Anish. Uh, with so much detailed considerations that you have pointed out, uh, moving on to the next question, what best practices should one implement right from the start? And when you talk about best practices related to farming, it's very critical that someone is very scientific in, its, uh, in his or her outlook. If they are doing farming, that's the right way to do it. Uh, that's the right way to get the uh, right ROIs and, you know, start turning out, uh, churning out profits sooner versus traditional methods. Because in India, you know, there are a lot of farmers who still follow uh, the traditional method. So, you know, going into the detailed pract uh, best practices, like before you start the season, you need to make sure you're doing soil testing. Uh, you're understanding what kind of soil you're dealing with uh, and what kind of inputs you need to add to the soil to grow the crop that you want to grow. Uh, the second thing is getting the right protocol uh, in place uh, from the right sources. Uh, even if you're growing barley, for example, there are 50 different kinds of barley. So which, which protocol applies to the variety of barley that you're growing, it's very important to get that right. Uh, preventative treatments are also necessary in you know, places where you have, you, you have a lot of termites in the soil, which might attack the seed. So you need to make sure treatments are done in advance before you put the seed in the ground. Uh, moving on to the in-season activities, uh, you know, you need to make sure you're driving irrigation efficiency, uh, you know, try to use renewable energy on your farm as much as possible. Agriculture also has a carbon footprint, uh, better to minimize it and minimize your costs in the process. Uh, you need to make sure you're monitoring the farm properly for insects, pests and diseases like we discussed. And then, um, you know, after the crop is matured and you come to the post-season, uh, I think one of the best practices that one can do is have a on-site storage. Uh, a lot of farmers in India are not able to benefit from the trends in market prices because they don't have storage capabilities. So I think that's a best practice if you're starting a farm, you know, have that on-site storage uh, and then build a database over time, like whatever you're doing on the soil, whatever you're doing with the crop, keep building a database so that you can uh, in the future, analyze what worked well, what did not work well, and then that informs your crop protocol moving forward. So that's something, you know, uh, you ensure that post season that's happening. And then I think the final best practice is to make sure you have identified the route to market, uh, plus the quality requirements uh, of, of the grain or whatever crop you're doing, basis the customer that you're going to sell it to. So if you are exporting, maybe you have better quality requirements. If you are uh, selling it domestically, the requirements are a little lesser, but they will really inform the kind of income you can get. So it's better to have that clear uh, right from the start as a best practice. Great. Now, I think that we understand the important considerations and the practices that we need to implement. Uh, what about sustainable farming? Is it difficult to do? Uh, sustainable farming is a tricky, it's, it's a tricky topic. Uh, Sustainable farming is basically, you know, farming to deliver your current needs without compromising uh, the ability for current or future generations to meet their needs uh, in the short term, medium term or the long term. Uh, if you look at how you do sustainable farming, the essence is that you minimize the use of chemicals, you know, different standards have different rules, but uh, primarily uh, it's all about minimizing use of chemical uh, or artificial inputs on your farm of uh, any kind, be it fertilizer, insecticides, pesticides, etc. So, you know, it is difficult to do. A uh, lot of issues with sustainable farming, you know, you need to prepare the land. The land needs to go through certain treatments over a period of time before you can do farming and then certify it as sustainable. 
the costs are a little prohibitive uh, for farmers who want to transition. So if you're a traditional farmer with a set income, it's very difficult for you to transition to sustainable uh, farming. It's a, it's a process. It's not a change that you can do instantly. Uh, you know, you take the Sri Lanka example where they banned import of uh, chemicals and now the farming ecosystem got so disturbed that they are not able to meet their needs. So it's difficult. Uh, it needs a lot of patience. It needs a lot of effort. But, you know, there are a lot of benefits that can be achieved from sustainable farming if you really focus on it over time and make it happen on your premises. Nice. Uh, what incentives uh, exist for someone who actually wants to do sustainable farming? Uh, in terms of incentives, I think the number one incentive is better prices, uh, better returns uh, on your farming costs if you find the right buyers. So it's very important to get the supply chain right. So that's the first incentive because uh, companies or organizations who are looking for sustainable products are ready to pay a premium for it uh, because their consumers are ready to pay a premium for it. For it. So you always have, uh, have those increased incomes when you start farming sustainably. Uh, you also see an uh, increased rate of return over time. Uh, oftentimes, you've heard stories that if you're transitioning a commercial farm uh, to a sustainable farm, you know, you will have a yield dip over the first few years. And then moving on to the fourth or the fifth or the sixth year, you will see the yields coming up again because then the land starts getting used to performing without any uh, artificial inputs. And you build an ecosystem which enables it to uh, get stronger and better over time. So you get a dip. Uh, because you've stopped using the chemicals but then once uh, once everything goes well over time you will see an increase so you that increase uh, happens uh, in sustainable farming uh, it also leads to farm long, uh, longevity so uh, we have had farmers talk to us about depleted soil nutrition over time uh, especially in some pockets of haryana uh, if you start doing sustainable farming uh, uh, you need not be worried about it you know, you are developing an ecosystem which enables the soil uh, to regenerate naturally. You are uh, not adding any chemicals. So, uh, you know, you don't need to worry about your soil uh, going bust at the end of the day. It leads to long-term sustenance of farm. Uh, and then I think the final benefit is a healthy ecosystem, right? Like the farmers live on the farm, their families live on the farm. So if you're farming sustainability, it's a much safer place to be at uh, versus being uh, located at a point where you're using a lot of chemicals and then they get into your food chain, uh, uh, which, is, which is not really good. So, you know, these kind of uh, incentives uh, are there for people who want to pursue sustainable farming. Interesting. I think a lot of benefits and incentives that are out there for practicing the uh, sustainable farming. Uh, moving on, what is the innovation sector uh, like uh, there in agro? Like, how is it performing, and what kind of support system exists for the first-time farmers? Yeah, uh, the innovation sector in agro in India is booming. Uh, you will find startups offering probably every service there is to be offered at a farm level from crop advisories to machinery, uh, to crop tracking, to satellite monitoring, to estimating yields. Uh, the ecosystem has really boomed. However, I think the drawbacks over there are, uh, especially for small and medium scale farmers, they don't really get uh, efficiencies in implementing these technologies. Uh, if implemented on a large scale, definitely they give you a rate of return. Uh, but if you're implementing it in a small scale, then you really have to think about how much money you are investing versus the kind of benefits you are able to drive. So there is that balance that needs to happen. However, for farmers, I think the good news is that every single aspect of farming that we talked about right now is enabled by technology. So you have providers out there who will support you, who will help you improve your operations or optimize your operations. Uh, so the ecosystem has really matured. Uh, I think the next step is how to understand uh, implement, uh, driving cost economies in this ecosystem, because that's really critical, uh, because otherwise you'll have a small subset of large farmers who are really high tech and digitized versus small and medium skilled farmers who will never be able to leverage these technologies uh, because of the limited benefits or the limited ROI coming out from them. So in a nutshell, I think the innovation sector is doing really good. Uh, however, you know, there are still some improvements to be made for all the innovations to become mainstream. Thank you so much, Anish. I think that's it for our viewers today. 
thank you so much for your thoughts and our audiences will learn more about the farming and would like have an innovation in the agro sector going forward we hope our viewers enjoyed the session and we'll be back soon with the next uh, topic in the next master class thank you so much thank you so much